On Monday, much of the world looked on in astonishment and horror as the Notre Dame Cathedral went up in flames. Across social media, there were a number of people who posted pictures of their trips when they had been there to see the cathedral. People shared memories. And people watched as many felt helpless, as many recounted a time that they firsthand got to experience all the beauty and all the majesty that the cathedral had to offer. As people, we love to look back. The saying is hindsight's twenty twenty, and I think that's one of the reasons that we love to look back is when we look back, we see things so clearly. We don't have that luxury when we look into the future. At best, when we look into the future, we have an idea. And even for the most visionary people, they have a rough sketch, a rough outline of how the future may, in fact, look. But there are variables that are beyond their control. And so when we, when we dream, that's very much what it is. It's a dream. We don't have the luxury of looking into the future and seeing in the same way we do when we look back. And so there's a certain fondness that nostalgia, the memory, presents within us all. And tonight, we're going to look back. We're going to look back nearly 3,000 years ago. We're going to look back 2,700 years ago to 700 years before Jesus even arrived on the scene. See, tonight we're going to look back in order to look forward. We're going to look back at the words written that God chose to write through a prophet by the name of Isaiah. And while we're limited by our glimpses of the future, God is not. And so God gave Isaiah and other prophets in Scripture glimpses. They didn't have all the detail, but they had much more detail than any of us would ever enjoy the luxury of as we look forward. So go back with me, if you would, to 700 years before Jesus arrived on the scene. Where we look at these very familiar words, starting in Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold... My servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. This was a message for people to know what to look out for. This was a message to people to say, be on guard, be alert, be looking for this and the one who would come to save you. And people would miss it. And yet each of these words would be fulfilled. As one week prior to Jesus' resurrection, he would ride into town and he would receive a hero's welcome as the crowds would come along the road and they would throw down tree branches and Jesus would ride victoriously into the city and a chant broke out amongst all that were there and they shouted Hosanna, which literally means save us as Jesus rode into the city. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and is formed beyond that of children of mankind. For just days earlier, Jesus rode into the city victoriously amongst chants of save us, save us, save us. Just days later, he would stand again in front of a crowd. But this time, the crowd was a mob. 
And there were nefarious people. There were bad actors inter, interspersed within the crowd. And yet this time the chant was not save us, Savior. This time the chant was crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And the guards came and they whipped him. And they beat him. And they punched him. And they brutalized him. And they spit upon him. To the point that if you were just to look at him, he was beaten so badly. He no longer looked human. There is a price to be paid. And that price is more costly than we will ever know. And there was our Creator. Brutalized, beaten by his creation. For it grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus chose to humble himself and to leave paradise, to come and to humble himself and to take on our form, to become like us, to retain his full divinity and yet marry that with full humanity. And when he came, he chose to be a commoner. He didn't choose to be in a royal family. He chose a common family. He chose to look average. That people wouldn't look at him and be drawn to him by his physical attributes or his physical features. They would look at him and see just a normal looking guy. Nothing special. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. The cries of save us, save us, save us would not last. They'd be drowned out just days later. And those that Jesus came to save would despise him. They would hate him for it because he didn't do it on their agenda. He chose to do it in a way that they didn't fully understand. He chose a different way than what they would have chosen. And it didn't make sense to them. And they didn't like it. In fact, they were threatened by him. He was despised. He was rejected. And here's the craziest part of all of it. He was despised and rejected the most by people who thought they were doing God's bidding. The very people who thought in their hearts they were doing the right thing were those that despised and rejected the God they claimed to serve the most. He's borne our griefs, he's carried our sorrows. There is no situation, there is no grief, there is nothing you will ever encounter. There is nothing you will ever encounter that Jesus cannot sympathize with. 
You may feel isolated. You may feel alone. You may feel like nobody understands you. You may convince yourself that nobody has ever had it as hard as you've had it in the world. And you may shut everyone else off around you because you just say, nobody can fathom what I have to go through. And yet... There's one who can not only fathom it, but has walked through even more. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The reason that Jesus was led to that cross was because of my sin and yours. Because of my mistakes and my rebellion and your mistakes and your rebellion. That is the reason that Jesus was led to the cross. His sacrifice led him to a cross, after which, before which he was beaten, brutalized, ambushed, mocked, ridiculed. And then as his body was breaking to the point that he could no longer carry his own cross, so they pulled somebody from the crowd and said, you carry the cross with them. And they finally got to the place where they would crucify Jesus right next to two common criminals. When they got to that place, they took his arm and his outstretched arm and they took nails and they drove the nails through his wrists to keep him hanging on that cross, and they drove a nail through his legs. He was pierced for our transgressions. Every second of agony was because of me and because of you. They took a crown, and they were mocking him and said, you call yourself the king of the Jews. They pushed a crown of thorns upon his head, digging into the flesh of his face. They nailed a sign, put it on his cross. They took a spear. And they thrust it into his side. He was pierced for my transgressions. He was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed because of my iniquity. He was crushed because of your iniquity. Upon him, upon Jesus, was the sentence that brings me peace. Upon Jesus was the sentence that brings me hope. Because I couldn't obtain peace on my own. Without the sentence of Jesus, there is no peace for me. Without the sentence of Jesus, there is no hope for me. And with his wounds, we are healed. He was given my chastisement. He was given my penalty. He offers me peace. He offers me hope. He offers me healing. And healing from our greatest ailment that afflicts us all. And that is our sin. All, every one of us, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We are guilty. Jesus paid the price. That's what today's all about. The fact that we have a God who loves us so much that he sees my guilt and he still desires to have a relationship with me. And so he sacrifices his son in my place so that I could be restored to him. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. He endured all of this willingly. He could have stopped it. At any time, he could have said enough. And yet his love compelled him. Stay silent, to endure the indignities, to walk willingly and quietly. Because of his love for us. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. He died not because of his faults. He died not because there were any mistakes that he made. No, he died because of my faults. He died because of my mistakes. And the Jews, because they were jealous and they hated Jesus and they wanted to put an end to this, they intended to have a disgraceful burial along with the thieves for Jesus, John 19.31 tells us that. But instead, fulfilling this prophecy, Jesus was buried with the rich in an honorable burial through a donated tomb of a secret disciple named Joseph of Arimathea. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquity. This was always God's plan. While we can't look at the future with any clarity, God can. Let me, let me tell you something. For those of you who are struggling with something and, and you question in your heart, can God love me? Because you've just blown it for maybe the 10,000th time in your life. And you've, you've done the song and dance routine and you've sworn it off. You've sworn it's not going to happen again and it's happened again. And it's come creeping back into your life. And, and you just allow the enemy to get a foothold and he reminds you of your past. He reminds you of all your regrets. He reminds you of everything that you've ever done. He reminds you of everything that's ever happened to you. He, you just think, I've, I've just, it's too far gone for me. I've done too much. There's no coming back from what I've done. Let me tell you something. First Peter 1.20 tells us something amazing. I'm just going to read this to you. He, Jesus, was foreknown 
before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Let me break this down for you. Before God created the world, before God created you, he already knew about your mistakes. Before the birth of your great, 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 great grandfather, whose name you don't even know, before any of that ever happened, God knew you. God made you. God had a plan for your life. God knew about your mistakes. And God loved you enough that he paid the price for you. Your mistakes don't catch God off guard. Your mistakes aren't too much for God to redeem. It is never too late for you. God's known it all since we can even fathom. The plan for Jesus to die was in place before the world was even created. That's how much God loves us. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And we saw this displayed on the cross when two criminals were, were crucified next to Jesus. And one of them cried out to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, I'll tell you the truth. I'll save you today. And he prayed for those who had just beaten him. He prayed for those who had spit upon him. He prayed for those who mocked him. He prayed for those who ridiculed him. And he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And Jesus continues to intercede on our behalf even today. What we saw displayed on the cross continues today in heaven for us. Now, all of this was written 700 years before Jesus was even born. God had the plan in motion before the world was even created. Because he knew. And he loves you anyway. And the question that we are faced with is what do we do with this? Do we ignore it because it makes us uncomfortable? We can offer a number of excuses, whether it's our past mistakes, whether it's something else, but at, when you just boil it down, it just makes us uncomfortable to have to say that I don't... I've got to relinquish part of my life. I've got to relinquish being in control of my life. I've got to do things God's way. I've got to give up control. Do we ignore it? Do we just shake our heads and say, well, I'm, I'm just unworthy? Because truth be told, we'd rather just hold on to the things we want to do anyways. Or do we embrace it? And accept the love that we can't fully understand. Love that would compel a God before he created us to figure out his plan to redeem us and then to humble himself to take on our form 
be beaten beyond recognition. Have the weight of my mistakes and your mistakes and my sins and your sins placed upon Him. And to lay down His life. Because there was a debt that I could not pay. The question tonight is what do we do with this? For those of you who've embraced it, we're going to sing a song. And during that song, we're going to pass out just a reminder. Jesus, in his last meal with his friends, was trying to give them just a heads up of what was going to happen, but they they were missing it. And he took the bread. And he broke it, and he said, this is my body, and it's broken for you. And then he poured out some wine. And he said, this is the blood, it's a new covenant. Drink this blood in remembrance of me. And so for those of us who have embraced the sacrifice of Jesus, tonight we remember, tonight we look back. Let us never forget what our redemption cost. Let us never forget that it was our mistakes and our sin that put God there, but God loved us so much that he was willing to go. And for the love of God, let's do better. Let's change. And when we fall short, we know that we are forgiven. It costs more than we can ever imagine. And our redemption was purchased by the blood of Jesus. He was on the cross. He cried out, It is finished. He breathed. And then he died. He paid the price for you and for me. God, I pray that we would remember what our redemption cost. Thank you for loving us. when We had nothing to offer you. And giving us freedom.